Hello and welcome to Data Diversity Talks, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers around data. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Data Diversity founder and CEO, Tony Shaw, about his career. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager at Dataversity. And this is my career in data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, you can go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. And today we are joined by Dataversity's own founder and CEO, Tony Shaw. And normally this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is actually what we're here to talk about. Tony, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Thanks for having me. How are you today? (laughs) Thanks for for joining us. Very excited to have you uh, on this podcast and and kicking, helping us to kick this off. Yeah, glad to be here. Tell me, I mean, I, you know, I, of course, know what you do and uh, what your job title is, but, uh, but, but tell everybody out there, what's your, what's your current job title and uh, sure. what are your responsibilities? Well, I'm, I'm the um, founder uh, of Dataversity and um, my, my current job title is CEO. Uh, so I, I do normal CEO stuff in that role, kind of oversee what everybody else is doing and um figure out what the company as a whole, uh, you know, what sort of business we should be involved in, provide um, governance over uh, all the various functions um, and uh, just kind of try to keep my my hand on the tiller so that we're Mm -hmm. heading in the right direction. I love it. Well, no, that's not your only job, right? You hold several different uh, roles. Well, day to day. So, um, you know, there's there's all the usual meetings to do the things that I I just mentioned. Um, primarily, I'd say I'm I'm a content person. I think where I add the most value is in figuring out what our content should be directed at, what um, what audiences it uh, needs to serve, how we go about serving uh, the information and education needs of our audience. You know, and when I say content, I mean both in terms of the subject matter, you know, what the topics are, as well as the formats in which we deliver that. You know, that's probably half my role. Um, so when we develop a new conference, for example, oh, when we're developing any any uh, new event, um, it, you know, I'm very involved in defining what that event is going to cover, uh, what sort of speakers we're looking at. Um, I'm very involved in uh, reviewing and selecting the presentations and deciding what balance of topics needs to be uh, included in that event in order for it to best address uh, our audience's needs. Tell me a little bit about Dataversity, why you founded it and how and what <clears throat> Dataversity is. Uh, honestly, I didn't I didn't get there immediately. <laughs> um, uh, I I grew up in Australia. For anybody who's wondering what my accent is, it's it's uh, not entirely North American, but I've, I've lived more than half my life in North America at this point. But I grew up in Australia and I joined a company down there that uh, was involved in the development of business conferences. And it was an international company that uh, had an office in New York at the time. But uh, I started out as a conference developer, conference producer uh, with that organization, it was called uh, IIR for the Institute for International Research. And it became, it became a hugely successful organization. It, it sold eventually for almost, um, or, or for over a billion US dollars um, after many years. I was, I was long gone at that point, but um, it, many folks may have heard of it. Anyway, I... Um, I, it, it turned out I was very good at figuring out what people wanted to learn. Um, and you do that through a fairly simple process of calling people up um, back before there was email capability. <laughs> um, uh, we would uh, 
read the, the newspaper, uh, read articles. We would find out um, who the experts were in a particular field. We'd call them up and say, you know, we're, we're thinking that this could be a topic that is interesting for people to attend a conference on. The very first conference I did was designed for corporate secretaries, which in Australia is kind of a chief legal and administrative function, um, often also a financial role. So uh, I talked to a number of corporate secretaries about what they needed to know in order to do their job better. And, you know, the weight of that input would then go into developing uh, a conference agenda. I would call up and talk to CPAs and lawyers and, and uh, you know, regulators and the people who's, who, who were responsible for advising corporate secretaries and develop a conference that way. And so it, it just turned out that, and the next one I did was for um, human resource professionals. Uh, then I did one for real estate developers and, and construction companies. You know, you would, you would in this job kind of go from one industry to another uh, and figure out what information needs do people have and develop a conference, design a conference specifically for them. And uh, it turned out I was just very good at, at figuring out what those needs were. Essentially, uh, my, my method, if you like, was to imagine myself in that role at a big organization or, or whatever was appropriate, you know, if it was a small organization, uh, just, you know, what's it like to have this role at that organization? What sort of questions would I be asking myself? And then that became my, my way of designing an educational event. Um, and I would, I would talk to the speakers and say, this is, these are the questions that people want answered. Um, can, can we invite you to do a presentation that addresses these? So from there, um, when, I, when I moved to the US, uh, the US is obviously a much larger and more specialized market. People don't, don't spread themselves across multiple industries in quite the same way that we did back then. So uh, I eventually got drawn more and more into the technology space. And some of the, the conferences I developed back in the late 80s were um, around uh, superconductivity, uh, neural networks. Yes, neural networks actually began way back in the 80s. They're not just a function of the past decade. Uh, we did uh, things like uh, over-the-counter financial options, um, which eventually became responsible for the global financial collapse. So um, probably should own up, own up to that one. But um, yeah, we, it, 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 was, it was kind of an open field at the time because there wasn't a lot of competition in the conference space 30 years ago. And um, so we, we went after whatever new markets we felt we could, could run a successful conference in. Um, where I started to get involved in data management was I joined a company called Technology Transfer Institute. Uh, they were based in Santa Monica. Uh, the, the owner of that company was a gentleman by the name of Leonard Kleinrock, who was uh, the person who sent the very first computer-to-computer -computer internet message, uh, yeah. or computer-to-computer -computer message before yeah. it became the internet. Yeah. Uh, Len was a professor at UCLA. His lab in 1969 had developed computer networking to the point where machine-to-machine -machine communication was possible. And um, so he had a very successful training business. Some of the people who I used to work with there, uh, probably the most famous at the time was, was James Martin, a prolific author and speaker. But uh, uh, Ed Codd and Chris Date used to do seminars for TTI before they started Codd and Date. Um, Tom DeMarco was a popular speaker. Um, it, it, was, it was a place where... Uh, I got to rub shoulders with a lot of very influential technology innovators. And um, Len's philosophy really as an educator was to have the best possible people doing the training. 
Um, you know, he felt that the, the person you most wanted to learn about something from was the person who actually created it. So um, that was a really interesting place to be. Uh, I was there about 10 years and became the CEO eventually. And um, that, that was just at the end of the 90s. And um, for whatever market reasons, I kind of forget now, but the, the seminar business was fading away. And so um, I had decided to go do a dot com and uh, it's going to be in the identity management space. And yeah. th there might be some folks listening to this who uh, are amused that the name of the company I chose was bigid.com. Uh, and I had that URL. It turns out there's now a very successful company called bigid.com uh, who obviously picked up that name after I'd long abandoned it. But uh, and they are in the data governance space. So we, we work with them now. Uh, it's kind of a crazy coincidence. But anyway, um, you know, if you looked into the lineage of that particular URL, I, I held it first. Uh, but uh, you, my, my uh, startup, you know, dot-com days were very short-lived. Uh, it turned out I was just not um, the right person to be running a, an organization, developing a, a technical product. Um, you know, my, my background generally is in marketing and, and business type roles. And so I started a company called Wilshire Conferences, which was the predecessor of Dataversity. And Wilshire ran a, an event called the Metadata Conference. That's where we hooked up with uh, Dama International originally. And um, so that was that was where I became more involved with data management. Um, and, uh, you know, progressively uh, moved towards um, the creation of Dataversity. Really the, the genesis of Dataversity was that at Wilshire Conferences, we were, um, we, I, I think we just had two events at the time, but, um, you know, it's just not very descriptive. It describes, that we do conferences, but it didn't describe um, that we were educating people, that we were involved in data. So, and one of my staff at the time came up with the name of Dataversity, which just was immediately popular with everybody uh, on staff. And we, we decided to go that, that way. And then shortly thereafter, I met you um, and, and you, turned Dataversity into more of what it is today um, with our significant digital presence. Um, uh, you know, you, you obviously built the, um, the publishing side of the business. I remained fairly committed to the event uh, side of our, our business, um, which until uh, COVID was still the primary driver of the business. But, you know, since COVID then, the digital programming has has obviously been far more significant. So that's the the much longer than you asked for introduction. But um, I, I guess one thing I would like to to say there is uh, I, I I don't consider myself a data management practitioner. Um, I am my expertise is more around training, publishing, um, and providing the right information to a data management audience. So um, quite honestly, I could not do the job that our audience does. I, I do a different job, um, you know, I think we do it pretty well and, and people like what we do, but um, I'm not an expert in data management. Uh, my expertise is really more in providing information and training and education to people, so. I love it. And there's certainly okay. some aspects that I didn't know before, which is great. Um, you know, and uh, uh, but it's true, though. I mean, is even though we are not um, data architects or data modelers ourselves necessarily, uh, it's I find sometimes uh, and um, maybe you do, too. The irony of what we do is always, you know, working to manage our own data and, and the data that we need to, to manage the business. Yeah, it's so valuable for, for whatever reason. Um... And I, I'm not quite sure why. I think partly it's the, this approach that I have of putting myself in the position of the person who I'm trying to provide a service for is 
and imagining what it must be like to be in that role. Uh, so for whatever reason, I, I found that I've been pretty good over the years at making connections between things. Y you know, I'll hear somebody talking about the application of technology to one area and I'll, I'll say, hey, well, that's interesting, but, you know, wouldn't, that, wouldn't this be a great solution for this problem instead? Mm -hmm. uh, the best example of that I can think is, is back when we used to um, be involved with semantic technology and the semantic web. Um, all the folks at the time who were in that space were trying to come up with the next Facebook or the next Google. You know, they, they were focused on social networks and, and search. Um, and I, I remember having conversations with people saying, yeah, but, you know, if, if you want to actually sell products into big organizations, uh, focus on, on practical issues like master data management or, or metadata management, because the technology that underlies these things um, that, that they were working on um, was really appropriate for solving the problems that MDM and metadata management were, were trying to get at. And, you know, it turns out eventually many companies did do that. You know, graph technology turned into numerous solutions that are, that are targeting uh, data integration and, and um, metadata repositories. And, you know, I give myself credit for that, at least as being able to, to kind of connect the dots sometimes more easily maybe than somebody who's really, you know, got their head uh, buried in, in a problem. What is it? Is it the architect or the engineer who has who knows a little bit about about lots of different things? I know less than an architect or an engineer, but I I know a tiny bit about a lot of different things, and sometimes that puts me in a good position to make connections. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Let's back up a little bit. So you, you know, you said you started getting into the conference business when you were still in, in Sydney. You know, I mean, back up even further, you know, is that what you wanted to be when you grew up? I mean, what was, what was the dream? What no, was I wanted to be an, a uh, as a kid, I wanted to be an architect. Oh, I really uh -huh. wanted to, to design buildings. I thought that seemed really cool. Um, yeah. my, my very first job out of high school was um, with a big Australian construction company called Lend Lease that, uh, and I, I worked for the building materials area. So I sold lumber, uh, building materials, all sorts of of things, which I really enjoyed. Uh, I can't, that was uh, what brought me to North America, actually, for the first time. I went to the Northwest, um, spent some time in Vancouver, Washington State, Oregon, visiting lumber mills and, and uh, joinery stores and like joinery shops, people who did fine woodwork, that sort of stuff. So I, I, much as I love that, um, you know, it turned out not to be where uh, where my skill really <laughs> lay. I'm, I was a bit more intellectual than I was handy with tools, so I ended up in a more in a more academic kind of a pursuit. But um, yeah, I, honestly, I I thought I was gonna. Uh, I did a business degree. I thought I was gonna end up working for um, Rank Xerox, sending uh, selling uh, photocopiers or something. I don't I don't know. I, I just. Uh, I should mention, I started out doing a marketing degree, had ambitions of, of being, uh, you know, in consumer marketing or something, but I, I failed my consumer behavior course twice, which was a psychology course. And um, so I was excluded from the marketing school and had to uh, go back a couple of years later and to do an accounting degree instead, which as it turns out was, was not of any detriment to my career. In fact, I think having an accounting degree has been incredibly valuable for me since then. Uh, I've never worked in accounting, but to this day, I, I use that knowledge in different contexts. Um, and it, it just helps me to understand business so much better than I would have if I didn't have it. But um, 
you know, in my early 20s, I just kind of stumbled from one job to another a bit until until uh, something stuck. So I I wish I could say I had an ambition that I I jumped into and you know got qualified for. And but um, most of the people who end up uh, in in the conference business, at least, and a lot who end up in the publishing business, do th- so through a fairly circuitous route. Um, and mine was yeah. definitely <laughs> circuitous. You still doing some work for TTI today, don't you? Well, yes. So what happened was um, around about 2000, um, the year 2000, um, uh, TTI had, uh, had sold off our biggest event and um, Len Kleinrock had this opportunity to take over a, uh, a strategic technology advisory service. It was called Vanguard, no relationship to the financial, uh, to the investment firm. Um, it was a division of a consulting company, um, a division of um, Computer Sciences Corporation, actually. But it was, a, it was a small service that they offered for elite clients as a business development exercise. So anyway, the, the, the thing that was really attractive about this was that the board of advisors for Vanguard was just this elite group of technologists. Um, you had Nicholas Negroponte, the, the founder of MIT. You had Alan Kay, the father of the, the GUI and sort of Apple's chief software architecture um, uh, architect. Uh, you had Gordon Bell, who was, you know, the father of the VAX. John Perry Barlow, a little bit of an oddball in that group, uh, but a, a very uh, prominent commentator and writer about the emerging digital space, the emerging um, cyberspace. Uh, John, John was such a character. He used to be a, a lyricist for the Grateful Dead, had so many great stories. Um, there was Bob Lucky, who was uh, the, the chief research guy at Bell Labs, executive director of Bell Labs. So anyway, um, Len really wanted to, to get involved in this and to, to take it over because CSC was resigning it. And I was CEO of TTI at the time. And we inherited it. Um, it was a very difficult business to run at first. We didn't really know how to do that, but eventually came to grips with it. And I, I kind of stumbled into the role of, of running the meetings. I mean, there was nobody else to do it. And, you know, running the meetings was, was a combination of just keeping us on time and on topic and hurting, hurting all the cats because you can imagine the board members there were, you know, they, they weren't really going to take direction from someone like me, <laughs> um, <laughs> which turned out to be an incorrect assumption and actually the most valuable business lesson I, I ever learned came from exactly that situation, but I can return to that in a minute. Anyway, uh, then shortly after that, I went off to do my .com, but Len asked me to, to stay in the role that I had. Um, and I, I just, uh, there, there were various um, owners and, and managers of that business over the course of the next many years. And, but they kept asking me to, to continue this particular role uh, of managing the meetings, and it became um, y- y- such a significant part of my own education over the years. Um, you know, I think in in every business, but especially when you're responsible for providing people with education, you know, you need you need input. I mean, being right. productive at your job it's one thing, but without the intellectual input to keep things going. To, to keep your perspective fresh, then it's it's very easy to get stale. And uh, this particular opportunity lasted for, well, it's still going. Uh, I'm actually running one of the, their meetings here in LA in June, but uh, of course with COVID, uh, everything's kind of shut down. So haven't really done much for the past couple of years, but uh, yeah, my, my role there is to um, keep us on time, keep us on topic and, you know, I think I think probably one of the reasons I've stuck around is that I, I have continuity. You know, I understand the culture of that particular business. Um, and it's not a big time commitment for me. But what has been fabulous about it uh, from the standpoint of data diversity is it's given me access to such a lot of interesting people who I've been able to bring into the data diversity fold. 
a guy like Doug Lennett, for example, the the CEO of of Psych, um, you know, probably the single largest, most consistent project on artificial intelligence in, in the history of technology. And um, Doug had spoken at many of our events. He he always, aside from just being a good speaker um, and very amusing, he just uh, has such a lot of value to add in terms of helping people understand complicated topics. And all of the board members were like that. That's why they had the role that they did. But yeah, anyway, um, the, the thing that I was going to mention that I uh, just touched on um, it was actually Doug who took me aside at the very first of these TTI meetings because he could see that, you know, I was, I was really being deferential, deferential DEF to the board members and the, uh, the, the people in the audience who were mostly C-level technology people. And he could see that I was being, you know, looking for them to direct what happened next instead of in my role as manager of the, the business and manager of the meeting, instead of me taking charge and running the meeting, which he said, you know, I can see that you you don't feel comfortable sort of bossing these, these people around, which I acknowledged. He said, just disavow that notion at all. Your role on this day is to run this meeting, keep it on time and they, they want you to tell them what to do, where to be next. You know, we're, we're ending this conversation now, we're going on to the next thing. And um, it took me a while to internalize that, uh, but it, it really, in, in retrospect, was the most valuable piece of professional um, advice I ever got because it, it became so applicable in other situations later. It's like, that was my role. Um, that's what was expected of me. If I didn't take that responsibility and execute it, then it wasn't going to get done because uh, nobody else was going to, you know, nobody else had the, the, right. the position to do the things that needed to be done. So it's been tremendously helpful. I've, I've passed that advice on to um, numerous folks, for example, who uh, who worked for the same organization. You know, that, that it's very intimidating. I mean, we would... We had Nobel Prize winners. We had, uh, sure. you know, CEOs of, of huge organizations. Um, Bill Gates and Larry Ellison spoke at those meetings, for example. Um, and, you know, there's a deference that's given to those folks because of their, their position. But in the context of that meeting, <laughs> everybody <laughs> needed, you know, boundaries and guidance and, um, you know, they respect you no matter who you are if you take ownership of that the responsibility that you have and you do it the best that you can um so yeah anyway i i've always thanked doug for that because once you once you do get the confidence to deal with you know senior or prominent people like that i i think you know it just becomes so much more natural and your relationship you just have a much better relationship with them. Yeah. Yes, certainly. I mean, that's amazing advice, certainly applicable to just about anybody in any situation. I've certainly seen you apply that in our conferences. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and I love the advice that you use to, you know, stay up to date, keep everything fresh, keep innovating. I think that's so important for anybody in any job, any role um, to, to, not get stuck and stale. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I, I really learned from working with that board was how to stop and and think. It's so tempting at times to like shut off new ideas um, because you know everybody's heard these stories about how uh, what who was it the founder of of digital equipment who said that or or IBM I forget which one now said, you know, nobody's, there's only going to be five computers that are ever needed. And the number of stories that, that these folks had about missed opportunities, because um, many of them had been there sort of from the very beginning, um, the, the number of stories about missed opportunities just from, from not 
understanding or not being open to understand. Uh, I, I, I give you the perfect example in my own life at the moment is, um, you know, there's all this uh, uh, talk about the metaverse, you know, this, this kind of digital version of reality that is theoretically coming. And, and we know that, you know, Facebook is positioning itself for this. And I don't know if this thing is going to happen. I'm like, I don't really want it to as, you know, as, as somebody who doesn't really participate in uh, online worlds or anything like that. I'm like rolling my eyes, hoping it doesn't come before I, I yeah. retire or expire or uh, cause I just don't really have any interest in it personally. But um, if I, if I allow myself to take that attitude and shut myself off to it, um, you know, I could be missing a huge opportunity either for our business or maybe, you know, for my stock portfolio or for, you know, my, my nieces and nephews who are coming up who, you know, want to know where technology is going. I mean, it, you know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but it, it's, I, I don't think I should be making a premature judgment about it right now and, and just saying that I don't like it, therefore... I don't want it to exist. It, um, it's clearly something that I don't understand at this point, and I need to learn a lot more about. Uh, at least if I'm going to end up with an opinion about the metaverse, at least let it be an educated opinion or an, or an informed opinion. So, in fact, uh, not to, not to um, be promoting ourselves right now, but uh, I've invited somebody to talk about the metaverse at our next online conference. Um, so I'm hoping Exciting. that I learn. I'm hoping that I learn <laughs> quite a lot from that particular talk. So uh, that's uh, that's some fantastic uh, multitasking. <laughs> Something interesting for our audience and you. And yeah. <laughs> um, I love it. Ready to mingle with your fellow data governance practitioners. Join us in Washington, D.C. this December for the Data Governance and Information Quality Conference. Five days packed full of new knowledge, new friends, and new strategies are yours when you register at dgiq2022east.dataversity.net. Take advantage of our super early bird pricing when you register before October 7th. But we do want to talk about dataversity a little bit. I mean, um, okay. where do you see... Data diversity right now, you know, what is data diversity? Why are people coming here? What's, what's, uh, what do we need? Yeah. Um, so as you would well know, um, you know, we, we uh, redirected um, our, our original uh, conference company more than 10 years ago now um, to become data diversity. And we, we introduced publishing, we introduced online training, uh, we introduced our, uh, a lot of free uh, webinar content. And, you know, the truth is that a lot of that activity was designed to help us develop an audience for the things that, that um, we hoped we could, we could develop a business around, which at the time was mostly the, the in-person events. Um, so I, th I think though that what we've seen since COVID is that you know companies and individuals now don't differentiate between in-person uh, learning and and, uh, and online learning to the extent that they used to. I think our in-person programming needs to address a much different set of needs now than just learning. You know, there's there's uh, obviously an experiential aspect to meeting with other people and being in a physical place that we need to um, take perhaps more, I, I don't want to say more seriously, but I, uh, to take it more into account in future is, you know, how can we enhance learning by being around other people um, as opposed to simply taking in a, a flow of information? I think where that's um, reflected in our programming, um, you know, COVID has been a huge learning experience for all of us. 
uh, at the at the first in-person program that we ran last December, um, we had two different sessions about uh, mindfulness and um, you know what it means to to be in the moment and and to be thinking in terms of the whole person as opposed to just solving this one data management problem. And I think um, I think you'll see that reflected in more of our content in future is, is, you know, putting our jobs in a larger context, a business context, a human context, you know, dare I say societal context. I, I don't want to get too grandiose about this, but I, I think people probably are not going to be meeting face-to-face as often as they used to. And therefore we need to take greater advantage of those in-person encounters to, um, to try to address a bit more than we have attempted to in the past. Um, and so mostly what I'm referring to there, are these things like, you know, the, the person and understanding the big, the big, uh, picture around what we do as opposed to just you know being very focused on the um the narrow aspects of a particular job function yeah something you've hit on a couple times now is is really you know just how you got into the business and what you found good is you know and and bringing up the mindfulness i think it all kind of ties well together is understanding how people learn uh, and, you know, all these changes that have happened over the last couple of years and understanding that, you know, mindfulness has become a very important thing in society and, and how people manage their day-to-day jobs, whether in data management or in something else. Um, and I like that that's really important to um, how we do business. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting, uh, I, you know, was probably as guilty as anybody of, of sort of saying, you know, when people come to conference, they want to, they want to learn as much as they can. And uh, clearly they want to network with other people and enjoy that. But, but, you know, I, I fell into the trap of thinking that the main, the main purpose was just this narrow professional interest. And I, I think since I recognize that COVID has changed this about me, then I assume it has changed it about a lot of other people too, that, you know, we're just looking for something else now. And I'm, I, I can't define what that is for, for other people necessarily, but, um, you know, I just understand now that we, we need to be broader, need to be thinking a bit more broadly about what, what it means to attend a week long professional conference. And, you know, the, Everybody kind of recognizes that the, the best learning comes from sitting next to the right person at lunch or at dinner or, you know, the, the, the places that you uh, enjoy the most are usually around those, those encounters outside the meeting room. So we're working hard at, at trying to figure out the best ways to give people those, more of those opportunities even online yeah uh, yeah it's i mean it turns out it's harder than you imagine to, to transfer that thing to to online um but it is possible so we're working on that that part as well you know there's i mean you try to create opportunities rather than than force the, the rather than forcing it you know you can't you can't just squish people together the the it seems to be this kind of serendipitous aspect um, of people connecting that I, I can't claim to understand, but that, that's probably something to edit out. <laughs> and it's, I think probably one of my favorite things you introduced me to is when we've gone as a company to other co- people's conferences, or even, you know, in where in social settings at our own conferences, you kind of have a rule that we need to all fan out and not sit at the same table. So we have the opportunity for those networking um, and encounters and those, uh, and those moments where you meet somebody who just inspires you to do something new and change and bring that back into the fold. Yeah, so, there's a couple of philosophies that 
uh, I've, I've always tried to bring to our in-person events. Um, one is the importance of peer-to-peer learning, meaning, you know, having case studies from people who talk practically about what they do, the, you know, the successes and failures, the, you know, if I was, if, if I was a data architect, I'd want to learn from another data architect as much as, or, or if not more than I would from somebody who had, you know, written a lot of articles or, uh, you know, cause, cause another data architect understands what I'm dealing with every single day. Um, like when I go to another conference, I want to hear from other people who are trying to market their, their educational products or um, come up with new ideas about how to make meetings more interesting. I'm certainly not diminishing uh, the expertise of, of consultants. I think that the, the, the great advantage of consultants is that they get to see experience across you know, dozens, if not hundreds of different customer organizations. But if I, if I want somebody to really understand my problem, then uh, I want to talk to somebody who, who has the same problem as me. Uh, right. I think that's why so many people talk about coming to uh, an event like Enterprise Data World or DGIQ and, and say, you know, they get such a, their, their batteries are so uh, recharged by the experience because, um, you know, they, they get to talk to people who have exactly the same challenges that they do. And maybe they've come up with solutions to that and that can be helpful. Or maybe they're just, you know, asking the same questions um, that could be helpful as, as well. But uh, yeah, that, that peer-to-peer aspect, I think, is just so important to having a, a, the right sort of having a, a really positive learning environment. So that's, that's why uh, that tends to be the the thing that directs us the most in, in developing the content for our events. I'm always looking for those case studies. Those, those will take priority over, you know, the, the folks who are maybe more expert, but ultimately, you know, program design is, is a matter of balance more than uh, almost any other issue. But yeah, anyway, uh, I, I feel like I didn't answer the question that you asked about the future of data diversity. Well, I just, I really just asked about what is data diversity today and what are we doing? So we haven't gotten into the um, future yet. Well, I could, uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can answer that to some extent. Um, you know, clearly data diversity today is, is as an organization much more focused on digital delivery than we were pre COVID. That's been by necessity. Thankfully we were actually in the business of digital delivery pre-COVID, so we didn't have to actually develop that capability, um, and we were able, you know, we had kind of a running start. But for many years, it was not the the thing that was driving the the bigger portion of the business. And now, now it is. Uh, I mean, that'll balance out a bit as we come back to some in-person events. But you know. I, I hate to talk in terms of positive outcomes from COVID because, you know, there, there really aren't many, but um, I, I think COVID has um, convinced a lot of organizations that they can still be productive without being face-to-face 100% of the time. Uh, and from the standpoint of the services that we provide, you know, Training can be productive. It's certainly uh, more cost-effective in many contexts uh, when delivered digitally. And uh, so we will continue to to push forward with the development of more uh, digitally-based training training, um, opportunities. So I I think we will continue to expand our offerings in the emerging areas of data, data management, things, uh, I mean, it seems, it, it, it seems like there's no slowing down the momentum for um, better data governance. And that's clearly a sweet spot for us. But, uh, you know, I, I would see us um, getting more involved with um, 
topics of artificial intelligence and and um, advanced analytics. I think that's clearly where a lot of business people want to be want to be uh, focused for the future and where a lot of innovation is happening. So, you know, I think generally too, particularly in our our role, you know, our our name, the diversity implies uh, education and. Uh, I can see us heading more in the direction of, of providing tools for a broader uh, data literacy of not just the big organizations that form part of our, um, that, that form most of our customer base at the moment, but perhaps uh, for society more generally. You know, we're not yet at the point of a data diversity TikTok, but who knows? <laughs> um, if we could capture entertaining data uh, <laughs> education in the space of 30 seconds or 60 seconds, yeah. um, then maybe we'll launch a Dataversity TikTok account. But I, I mean, I, I think we've seen many examples of where it, it could be incredibly, it could be transformative if more people understood about, if, if more people were more literate about data and I'd, I'd love for us to play a useful part in that, if it's possible. I love it. So in terms of, I mean, obviously we're still, uh, as a company focusing in data, data management. So do you see those data management jobs, like uh, those involved in data governance, those involved in data science, data scientists, data engineers, data architects, do you see those jobs continuing, growing over the next few years? Do you see, um, is this a yeah, good industry seem- to get into? Yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to me that, that there's anything that will slow that uh, trend down. You know, we've, um, we've seen an increasing audience around all the topics that, that we provide. Um, uh, so I, my sense is that that will continue, you know, whereas our, our focus up to this point has generally been on... Um, uh, a North American centric, you know, English speaking uh, community, um, you know, as well as I do that when we run um, a, a conference, uh, we see people from every corner of the world. Um, and so I think um, a big part of our uh, growth in future may well come from um, an international audience, but yeah, I, I, I think we're at the, really at the, a very kind of immature level of um, acceptance or, or um, you know, one of, the, one of the surveys we did recently of our own community of data uh, governance professionals, uh, you know, the, the survey data from that demonstrated that w- there were, I think, less than 10% of the audience felt that they were at a level of reasonable maturity. They were almost all at the level of, we're thinking about it. Uh, we have a plan, but we haven't started. Or they were at the level of, we've started, but it's still very early days. So, yeah. um, you know, I think if you just deal with the folks who are already engaged with us, you'll see that everybody's just... <laughs> just getting started for the most part. Almost everybody is just getting started. So, yeah, I think there's a, there's a long way to go. Uh, any advice you give for people getting into data management? Well, again, I'll, I'll stress that I'm not a data manager myself. However, as somebody who's not a data manager who has become involved very extensively with data management professionals. Um, I think the thing that has enabled me to understand what our community has to deal with is that I I have a pretty good business sense for how data can be useful. And I think if, you know, if everybody had the opportunity before they got into any professional specialization, be it data management or financial management or, you know, any, anything that has more of a specialization, I would say, try to get a, 
a sense for the broader business um, because that's what drives the need for whatever those specialist skills are. And, you know, I, I'm probably just putting some different words around uh, things that I see data scientists writing about or, or um, engineers writing about. I mean, people who um, do startups, for example, you know, some startups come from technical specialists, but for the most part, not. They come from business people who have better business ideas. So I think if, if you have data management skills or, or if you have a, an interest in what data management involves, um, you know, try to get some exposure to the business problems directly from a business standpoint um, and you will serve yourself and your employer better in the long term. You know, just understanding what it's like. My, my early jobs were in sales and marketing. Just understanding what it's like to be on the phone with a customer or to be standing on the other side of, of the counter in a retail operation. Practical business issues like those where data management can be uh, vital for solving a problem. But without that perspective, then you you know, it's really hard to appreciate what those opportunities are. So sure. that would be my, my broad advice. Um, you know, maybe easier said than done, but yeah, I, I speak as a, you know, as someone with a bit of an entrepreneurial bent. So I like, I like to find business solutions. I'm, I'm sort of drawn to that aspect of the, uh, the, the data management life cycle, I guess, as opposed to, you know, the, the detailed technological solutions, but sure. um, yeah. I love it. Well, anything additional you want to add, you know, certainly this is the time to plug anything that you would like to. to um, plug. I don't know. I feel like I've, I've just talked about <laughs> myself for an hour. Um, <laughs> yeah. I Look, all of us at Dataversity are really excited about getting back to face-to-face meeting um the the recent the the fact that we were not ultimately able to do that with enterprise data world this year is a huge a huge disappointment and you know we understand why i mean people people are still reluctant to get back particularly we we made that decision during the omicron surge and i i think it was the right one but you know, the, the experience we had last December when we were able to get back together, uh, even with a, a smaller audience, it was just, it, it was kind of a combination of, of relief, um, inspiration. Um, it, you know, it felt so good to be face-to-face learning and, and talking about stuff with people uh, just a few feet away from you. Um Look, I, I, I hope obviously that there's there's no more setbacks. Um, we are very careful when we go on site. Um, we will continue to be very careful. You know, we we actually hire a company to do financial mod. Uh, pardon me, not financial modeling to do um, risk modeling um, prior to each of our events this year, uh, based on the location of the event. The um, the configuration of the meeting space, the the type of uh, attendees who are um, we we work with a company called Epistemics who does um, risk modeling of that meeting delivery to tell us the the risks of meeting face uh, of the risks of contracting uh, COVID during a face to face meeting at this point I'd say are extremely low because um, a this precautions be that the audience is very safety conscious. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, I think the risks inherent in attending an, a business conference at this point are actually among the best <laughs> that you might get up in any other context. We're very excited about getting back to meeting. Um, we're also, though, very excited about all the other things that we're doing. Um, 
So uh, it would, whichever way folks choose to engage with us, um, we'll continue to, to do our best to exceed expectations and um, you know, deliver, deliver the value that people are looking for, so. I love it. And uh, if, to find out more, you can always go to dataversity.net for everything, find out what we're yeah. doing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All um, right. I do well, want to um, maybe sign off with something, which is just a, a thank you to everybody who's been so supportive in the past couple of years. Um, you know, when we when we first faced uh, the cancellation of the 2020 EDW program, um, if everybody at that point had said, "Give us the money back," you know, we 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 would have been out of business within a few weeks. We didn't, you know, in our business, we, we take in registration fees and sponsorship fees and we, we pay people, we pay deposits, we, we line up vendors. Um, and, you know, this was about a week before the conference, I think when this happened and um, uh, there's just no way that we could have, have paid every, refund request if, if that had been the case. Um, we also faced some hefty um, venue cancellation fees, which thankfully eventually were removed. But, um, you know, the, the outlook was really quite um, difficult for a while there. And thankfully, um, uh, our customers were extraordinarily understanding and uh, allowed us to sort of keep the money that they'd given us with a promise to deliver in the future. Uh, in many cases, we, we offered folks uh, digital uh, products and services in lieu or in others, we, we said, we'll carry your credit forward for as long as um, necessary for you to be able to use it in future. Um, and that understanding uh, has enabled us to survive as a business to, to this point. Um, now things changed in the meantime and you know the digital uh, deliveries worked out for us. And so um, I do wanna thank everybody who is considerate of our situation at the time and willing to trust us. Um, that was the difference, frankly. So we will remember that and um, just do our absolute utmost to, to um, you know, be as good as we can uh, in in future years, because uh, we we owe a lot of folks for their their trust. So that's true. I, you know, one of my favorite parts of this job is we work with an amazing community. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational articles, blogs, and webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.